All right, Hope, how we doing? We good? Nice. Nice, you're really good. That's awesome. Hey, uh, I'm, my name's Ben. I'm a pastor from out in Colorado. Um, I've been out here a number of times. I'm a, I'm a friend of Hope, and Hope's been a really good friend to me. But I've been out here a number of times to the point where it's like, I'm not even going to introduce myself <laughs> anymore. If I haven't met you yet, I would love to meet you. Come say hi to me after this. But we won't do any intro. We're just going to jump in today. Um, actually, before we jump in, I want to say just a really special welcome for any of you. If you maybe came to Hope for the very first time last weekend for Easter services, and now you're here for a second time to just give it one more shot, if that's you, welcome. Welcome. All right, if you're the kind of person who's trying to figure out faith, but you feel kind of behind the ball, you're in the right place. Me too. I'm trying to figure out faith, and I feel like I'm kind of behind the ball all the time. Um, you're in the right p- place because hope is kind of like an island of misfit toys for people when it comes to faith. All right, so you're in the right place. Um, you can feel free to jump into this community. You can also feel free to kind of chill in the back and not talk to anyone if that's what you need right now. We just want to say, welcome back. And then also an, an encouragement for if you're one of the like 200 people, which is crazy, who last week had that conversation with Jesus where you're like, all right, I'm done fighting you. I'm ready to follow you. If that's you, that's awesome. I just want to encourage you to lean in and keep going. I prayed that same prayer 15 years ago, totally changed my life. But I also know that I prayed that prayer and I was like, all right, Jesus, I'm ready to follow you. And immediately after that, I was like, I don't even, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what I'm supposed to do right now. And if you feel that way, it's okay. You're actually here at the right time because that's what this series is all about. This series is about the foundations of our faith. All right, and you hear that title and some of you might be going like, it sounds very scholarly. Is this gonna be boring? Well, no, I believe that making Jesus boring is like the greatest sin on earth. It's not gonna be boring. Instead, let me explain what this series is about. We're gonna kind of do it in a roundabout way, but we'll explain it. All right, so there are, there are many cultural historians and social scientists, both people who are Christians and people who are not Christians, who believe that America is currently a post-Christian society. That's the term for it. And don't freak out. All it means is a post-Christian society is one that no longer considers Christianity to be the foundation for its ethics and culture. Okay, It doesn't mean that Christianity is dying. It just means it's not the foundation for our culture. And again, that's, that's fine. We don't need to freak out or get grumpy about that. We're going to be just fine. All right. Some of you now are going like, well, then, dude, why are you even bringing it up? Well, great question. I'm bringing it up because from my observation, at least, like living in a post-Christian society, especially for me, like raising, trying to raise kids in one, from my observation, my culture feels very foundationless in a lot of ways right now. Like, like, for example, I see a confusion in my culture as it tries to create moral and ethical beliefs without using Jesus, Christianity, or the Bible. Prime example of that is in 2005, the Supreme Court decided that it's unconstitutional to display the Ten Commandments inside courthouses, even though our judicial system largely based on Judeo-Christian ethics. It's just confusing, right? To to kind of clear that up for you, what happened is the Supreme Court, which is ultimately based on many Christian ethics, used those ethics to declare that it's unethical to display those ethics inside the courthouses that uphold those ethics. It's confusing. It feels foundationless. I see the same, like, foundationless aspect of my culture, like, leak into people's personal lives, Okay, if, you, if you get on social media later today, you're, you're going to see a lot of people who are very vocal about their beliefs, but they don't have, they can't give any moral foundation for their beliefs other than just like, well, that's my truth, right? You do you, but that's my truth. There's no foundation. This is why so many arguments these days can really be boiled down to full grown adults going like, yeah, huh, no, uh, yeah, huh, and that's it, because we don't agree on anything. We don't agree on what is true right, wise, and good. And we got there in kind of a a roundabout way, but that's what this series is all about because we're gonna talk about the foundations of our faith because there's like, there's like a few core foundations that you're going to find at the bottom of every single story in the Bible. You're going to find them at the bottom of everything that Jesus taught, every idea about him, every idea from him. In fact, these same foundations you'll find at the bottom of every great movie 
in every beautiful novel ever written and every human soul walking around the planet. And the fancy like theological terms for these foundations are creation, fall, redemption, and sanctification, okay? But some of those are like $10 words for people who went to Bible college. And so if we're just gonna use normal language, the foundations for our faith, and I would argue for understanding just existence, are this. We are created, we are broken, we can be fixed, and we are on our way towards something better. Those four things right there, I believe that that should shape the way that we view everything, like absolutely everything, the way we view ourselves and other people and the way we view our culture and our context and our history, like we're created, we're broken, but we can be fixed and we're on our way towards something better. And, and whether you follow Jesus your whole life or you're just checking him out, I would tell you that these, these four foundations, I believe they can become steady ground, a steady foundation for you to stand on while you try to navigate a foundationless culture. And so that's what we're going to talk about for the next four weeks. We're going to get started right now. And I want to start by talking about our identity, your identity. Okay, there's this phase of life. Everyone went through. It happens when you're pretty young. Um, My kids are 10, 9, and 6. And so we've been in this phase for a few years now. But it's this phase where in your little kid mind, something clicks and you tell yourself, maybe if I'm mean to other people, it will make me feel better. Okay, it's just, it's human nature. It happens to everybody, right? But you're also little, so you're bad at it, right? You don't know how to really stick it to someone yet. And so what do you do? You start name calling, right? Name calling is kind of the first step in our like journey towards learning how to become mean to one another. But you're not even good at that yet because you're little. And so it leads to some pretty hilarious name calling at times. Like the names that my kids call each other are ridiculous, (laughs) Right, And then I'll remember, I'll never forget this story. When I was little, I was probably like eight years old. Um, I had this neighbor friend, his name was Jeremy. We didn't play very often. Um, Like I didn't know him too well. He was two years older than me. And when you're eight, it's like, this dude's an adult in my mind. (laughs) You know, he's 10, he's like renting cars and stuff. Um, So, but every now and then the stars would align, I would go play with Jeremy. Okay, so one day, we're in my driveway, we're playing basketball, he beats me. I know it's crazy to think of someone my stature losing a basketball game, Um, but it was an upset, and he won. Um, And so I turned to call him a name, and I remember I wasn't even being, like, I didn't feel mean, it was more just kind of like, I was trying to be humorous, but I call him a name, and here's the name that I called him. Um, My dad was a cartoonist, okay, so I grew up watching lots of cartoons, and Yosemite Sam used to say the word dastardly all the time, with a D, dastardly, (laughs) okay? Somewhere along the way, in my little kid mind, that got confused with a very similar (laughs) sounding word, and so Jeremy beats me in basketball. I look at him, cucumber cool, and I'm like, Jeremy, you are such a fill in the blank, Well, he's an adult, he's 10, he knows these words. So he cries, he goes home, I'm so confused. Okay, I was confused enough to go inside and tell my mom. (laughs) I was like, mom, weird thing just happened. I explained the whole situation to her. She's of course like, Benjamin, where did you hear that word? And I'm like, mom, Looney Tunes, like chill, it's fine. (laughs) I didn't have to wash my mouth out. I did have to go apologize, but we learned to call each other names at like a really early age. And now we're adults, so if we can look back on that and kind of think for just one second on what we're actually doing to people when we call them names, we realize that it's really messed up. Because what we're doing is we're saying, hey, you're not Jeremy to me, right? You're not this like individual. You're not this unique, valuable person in my life. Instead, you're just a fill in the blank with whatever term you wanna identify them with. That we're, what we're doing is we're, we're taking their true identities and ripping them out and replacing them with really bad identities. And we start doing this when we're like four years old. And of course, I'm, I'm talking about right now like the juvenile form of name calling, but be honest with yourself. There are some names that you have been called, some ways that you've been defined and they've stuck around. Right? They stuck around for a really long time. And, and these definitions of who we are, these bad identities, they're not cute, they're not funny. And if we're being honest, we've spent a lifetime either A, trying to prove those names wrong, or B, 
we just started agreeing with those names. Here's what I mean. I'll go first. For me, a name that I took on at a really young age is I am weak. Okay, for me, I honestly, I really, like, I haven't grown since eighth grade. <laughs> like, since eighth grade, I've been 5'7 and, like, 135 pounds soaking wet. And in eighth grade, when it feels like all my friends are, like, you know, growing a foot a day and getting buff and growing goatees and stuff, I was, like, the kid in the corner who was, like, do you want to start a punk band with me? That's, that's who I was. And I was also, you know, bullied and picked on in the whole nine yards. And so I walked away from my childhood with a name that says, I am weak. I'm 38 years old now, and I hate to admit it, but I still spend a lot of energy trying to prove that name wrong, trying to prove that I'm not weak. I'm not that eighth grade kid anymore. Spend a lot of time doing that. For me, I didn't do that in a physical sense. For me, I tried to overcompensate in other areas. Right, so for me, I focus on like, I gotta try to be the funniest person in the room or I've gotta be like the smartest or the most creative or the hard, at least the hardest working person in the room all to prove that I'm not weak. I'm not that eighth grade kid anymore, right? That's, that's my thing. What's your thing? I, I don't know your story. You know your story. For you, maybe mom and dad or dad didn't stick around. And so you, just, you got this name at a really early age. It said, I am unwanted, you spent the rest of your life trying to prove that that's not true, or you just started to agree that you're unwanted. Actually, think of it now. What is the bad identity that you're carrying around today? I am what? I am ugly. I am forgettable. Right? I am an easy date. I am annoying or stupid or worthless. What is your bad identity? At the end of the day, your identity totally boils down to your answer to this question. Who are you? Who are you? However you answer that question, that's your identity. And whatever your identity is, it will shape the way that you live the rest of your life. And if we're being honest with ourselves, a lot of us are living out of really bad identities. And then you throw in our foundationless cult culture and the fact that it doesn't really have a good answer for the question, who are you? And so it's no surprise that a lot of us are looking to successful careers or political stances or sexual conquest or physical accomplishment to define who we are and replace our bad identities. And so what do we do about this problem? Well, this is where the, the first foundation of our faith in our existence comes into play. Because when I ask you, who are you? Jesus has an answer for that question. And I'm telling you, if you let the answer to his question become the foundation for your identity, honest to God, it could change your entire life. So what is Jesus's answer to that question? Well, we actually find it on the very first page of our Bibles. Okay, like this foundation, this, this understanding of who we are is so important that it's literally the first thing you will encounter when you open up a Bible. The, the first sentence of the Bible, the first verse of out of over 23,000 verses goes like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, in the first 10 words of the Bible, God is trying to communicate to you that God is the creator, he is the creator. He wants you to know right off the bat, he created everything, like everything. Okay, he, he created big stuff, like the solar system with all of its planets, and he created the small stuff like microbiology and DNA and all of that, and he made, you know, just like the world colorful just because, and he made caterpillars turn into butterflies just because, and he gave you taste buds so that you could enjoy pad thai just because he loves you, right? He just created all of this for us. And one of my personal favorite creations of his is he made this incredible phenomenon where if you crudely hammer the right type of metal wire pulled to the right amount of tautness, and if you crudely hammer a bunch of those wires at just the right time, you're listening to Beethoven, Right? Sometimes, unfortunately, you're also listening to like Taylor Swift and K-pop, but that doesn't really <laughs> prove my point right now. The point is that God is the creator, and the world that he made is, is magnificent. His works are wonderful. But then the, the first chapter of Genesis goes a step further. Okay, we're not only told that God is the creator, but on top of that, we're told that God is your creator. We find that in verse 26. 
To kind of summarize what happens between the first verse and verse 26, God spends five days creating everything in the world. And at the end of every single day, he keeps saying that his creation is good. This is good. This is good. But then after the end of day six, it's the first time he says that his creation is very good. And that's because he creates men and women. Look at this. Then God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the livestock and the earth and all the creatures that move along the ground. And so then he did it. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them, and God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Only after creating humanity does God call his work very good. Like, humanity is basically where God really outdoes himself. Humans are like his magnum opus, like the pinnacle of his creative work. In God's eyes, you and I are simply his masterpieces. Why? Well, because we're the only piece of his work that was created in his own image. We'll come back to this image of God's stuff, but first, right off the bat, don't let that pass you by. That right there gives you a better foundation for your origins than our culture can right now. Because here's the truth. For some of us, this is a truth we honestly, we don't wanna face right now, but we should. The truth is that if we weren't created, there's no hope. I mean, there's no hope for literally any, like take the word off the front of the building. There's no hope. Why? Because we're all just biological mistakes, right? We're just accidents kind of stumbling around this globe, like loving people for, for no good reason and just like hurting each other for no good reason and wanting everything to change for no good reason. It sounds harsh, but it's the truth. If we weren't, weren't created, who cares about being a good person, why care about anything for that matter? Why care about anything from like social justice to recycling? And frankly, if we weren't created, who cares that you feel worn down and defeated today? Who, who cares? You're a mistake of nature and an impersonal universe doesn't care about its mistakes. And who cares that you feel aimless today? You're an accident. Accidents don't have purpose. So your life has no purpose. Right? So I guess the only thing you can do is kind of stop whining and pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Stop feeling sorry for yourself because in this huge cosmic accident called life, stuff just happens sometimes. So get over it. Now, I don't agree with any of those statements. I used to, but I don't agree with them anymore because I started to agree with God in the first chapter of his words to us. And so before I become like the most emo episode of Bill Nye the Science Guy ever made, this is exactly why in the first chapter of the Bible, God tries to make clear the truth that God is your creator. This is the first wonderful and honestly, it's like a relieving truth that you encounter in the Bible. You were created on purpose. You're not an accident. You're, you're not a mistake. Instead, you are one of the masterpieces of the world's greatest artists. You were created on purpose. To ease your mind, this is a truth that's not contained in just the first chapter of the Bible. It works its way throughout the entire book. Like in Isaiah, God tells us, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. You're not lost in a sea of humanity or history. You're not anonymous. God knows you by name. In Psalm 139, David is reflecting on this idea that we were created on purpose. And he says, he says, for you, God created my inmost being and you knit me together in my mother's womb and I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made and your works are wonderful. I know that full well. It's this image of, of God as the craftsman, like lovingly sculpting the person that would become you, like with your physical features and your dreams and aspirations and your personality, even your weaknesses through which God would display his strengths, all of it lovingly knit together in your mother's womb. You were created on purpose, okay? You are not a nobody. You're not even just, you're not even just a somebody, you are a masterpiece on a first name basis with the creator of the universe. You were created on purpose. But then we can't stop there, because right? 
Genesis keeps going. There's, there's more to this foundation of our faith. We weren't just created on purpose. We were also created for a purpose. And this is where the whole image of God stuff comes into play. Okay, to, to refresh your memories, what we just read in Genesis, we're told that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So you and I and all of humankind, we were created in the image of God. What does that even mean? Okay, personally, I am of the opinion that this is one of the most important things you could ever wrap your mind around. Okay, you can take long division and how to make your front yard green again or whatever and move them way down the list of things to learn right now because this image of God stuff is super important. So what does it mean to be created in the image of God? Well, some people will say, oh, well, that means that humans have inherent value and dignity because they were created by God. I totally agree, and I believe that, but it doesn't explain the image of God because all things were created by God. And so all things have inherent value and dignity, not just humans. Like the lush green woods of North Carolina or the majestic mountains of Colorado from back where I live or like the dog waiting for you back at home. Or God forbid, maybe you bought cats or whatever. Like <laughs> All created things deserve inherent value, dignity, and worth because they're all jaw-dropping works of the world's greatest artist. Uh, another thing that people will say is that being made in the image of God is the reason that humans have morality, our sense of right and wrong, and it's the reason that humans have rationality, our ability to reason things out. Again, I believe that's true, but it doesn't explain the image of God. There's morality in the animal kingdom. Like chimpanzees have been observed consoling family members who have lost babies. And there's morality, there's rules for how animals govern their own families and, and tribes. And they're also rational. There's a reason that scientists are obsessed with rats. It's because rats are whip smart and can come up with solutions for problems pretty easily. And so we're still back at square one. Like, why are humans unique? What does it mean that we're created in the image of God? And for today, we're just going to tackle the most simple understanding of the image of God. That word image in, in the Hebrew, it's a Hebrew word, salem. And salem means sculpture. And so in other words, to say that human beings are created in the image of God is the same thing as saying human beings are sculptures that represent God. What does that mean? Well, I've always loved how this pastor, I'm not as smart as this, this pastor named John Piper explains it in a way that I love. He says this, imagine this. You got this artist, like just a normal human artist, and, and they go and make a sculpture. And let's say they put this sculpture in a public place, like out in Washington, D.C. or whatever. Well, they make it, sure, because they want people to look at it and notice it, but specifically they want people to think about the person that the sculpture represents. And they want them to think specific things about that person. That's why they made the sculpture of this person look heroic or look like a leader or look wise or whatever that is. And so what God has done is currently in 2024, he's placed 7.8 billion sculptures of himself on planet Earth. Why? Well, because like any other artist, God wants people to look at those sculptures and then think about the person that the sculpture represents. In other words, we have a purpose out here as human beings. And our purpose, unique amongst the rest of God's creation, our purpose is to represent the characteristics of the person whose image and likeness we were sculpted in. That person would be God. What is unique about being created in the image of God? The answer is humans are uniquely created to represent the characteristics of God to the world around them. Like, that is your life's purpose. Whether you believe it or not, or whether you want to admit it or not. It's your life's purpose. You are a sculpture that reflects God, and you are to reflect and represent him well with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and, and through all of your thoughts and actions and words, you and I are supposed to basically be saying and shouting to the world, like, this is kind of what my God looks like. I'm getting as close as I can. Like, this is 
who he loves, and this is how he loves. Like, this is what he does when the, when the cards are down, and this is how he behaves when things are going well. Like, this is kind of what my God looks like. That's our purpose. This is why I believe that understanding the image of God is like one of the most important things we could wrap our minds around, because sure, it's a foundation for our faith. That's true. It's also a foundation for how you view the purpose of your life. It's a foundation for how you view the rest of humanity. It's a foundation for how you treat your friends and family. It's even a foundation for how you treat your enemies. Every human being out here on earth, whether they follow Jesus or not, is an image bearer of God and they should be treated as such. That's why like murder, for example, is is offensive to the Jesus follower because we're supposed to view it as one sculpture of God like demolishing and turning to rubble another sculpture of God. Or let's get even closer to home. Let's take gossip, for example, talking trash about someone behind their back. Jesus followers are supposed to find that offensive because we're supposed to view it as one sculpture of God defacing and spraying graffiti all over another sculpture of God. In fact, here's a simple way of understanding sin itself because sin is a word you almost only ever hear in church and sometimes we get disconnected from it. A simple way of understanding sin is to view it as anything that misrepresents the image and likeness and characteristics of the God we were sculpted to represent. Sin is any time we're being confusing sculptures. What what I mean by that is if you go to like the Lincoln Memorial in DC, you're not gonna see a statue of Abraham Lincoln like shredding the electric guitar. That would be confusing, right? People would look at that and go like, I don't think... Abraham Lincoln ever did that. And in the same way, when we belittle our spouses, when we delete our phone's history to hide our searches, when when we flip off the car that cut us off, or when we cut people down to climb the corporate ladder, ladder, we're being just confusing sculptures because I don't think Jesus ever did stuff like that. And we're supposed to be representing him out here in this cold, hard world. The first foundation to understanding our faith, and again, I would argue it's the first foundation to understanding our entire existence, is to understand that we are created, and not just that, but we are created on purpose and for a purpose, and our unique purpose is to represent the characteristics of God to the world around us. Now, that was a lot in a short amount of time. And throughout the rest of the series, we're gonna talk about the rest of the foundations, right? It's gonna help you make sense of the way you view the world. Like, we're gonna talk about what went wrong. Like, how did we get broken? And how does it get fixed? And what does it look like to just kind of trudge on towards perfection for the rest of our lives? Like, but to end today, to end right now, all I wanna do is take a moment to just remind us of who we truly are. Okay, one of my favorite descriptions of God is in Psalm 3. It goes like this. It says, you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and you are the lifter of my head. So it's, it's like this picture of God as a perfect father walking up to his sons and daughters, that would be you and me, walking up to his kids who have hung their heads in defeat, and it's this picture of him placing a finger under your chin and lifting your chin, lifting your head back to a posture of confidence, back to a posture of security, and back to a posture of true identity. And so I'm gonna ask that you do something with me right now, only if you feel comfortable. You don't have to do this, but if you feel comfortable, I'm gonna ask that you close your eyes right now and just bow your head, almost like you're praying. Right? Or maybe just put your head in your hands right now. Like, basically take on the posture of defeat. Because I told you, or, or like at the beginning of this thing, we, we talked about the bad identities that we carry around all the time, the bad identities we've been carrying around for years. I want you to think of yours right now. I won't leave you in this place for long, but for now, actually think of it and hang your head in defeat. What name have you been called? What name have you been calling yourself for far too long now? I am what? I am weak, stupid, worthless, unimportant, unwanted. I'm a bad mom. I'm a bad dad. I'm a bad kid. What, what is your bad identity? And in your head, say it to yourself like you've said a thousand times before. Let it sink in, the fact that you've been carrying that name around 
for decades. And now, here, here's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to tell you what God says about you. That's what you say about yourself. Right now, I'm going to share what God says about you. I'm just going to walk through our, our true identities because of what Jesus has accomplished for us. And when you're ready to just listen to a voice that's louder and stronger than the one in your head, then just as a small act of faith, as a small act of telling God, like, I, I want to listen to who you say I am, not who I say I am. As a small act of faith, you're just going to lift your chins, lift your heads. All right, so here's what God says about you. He says, because of Jesus, you are treasured and you are valued. You're not forgettable. You're not overlooked. You're not unwanted. You are treasured and you are valued. God says you are here on purpose and you are here for a purpose. You're not a mistake. You're not some accident of the cosmos. You're not inconsequential. You're not anonymous. You are here on purpose and for a purpose. God says you are loved. You are not hated. You are not irredeemable. You are not too far gone. You are loved. God says that you are worth dying for, which means you're absolutely not worthless. Not in God's eyes. You are worth a very great price, a price that he paid. He says you were worth dying for. God says you are forgiven. Dude, you, you are not the sum of every stupid decision you've ever made. It has no factor in your relationship with your father anymore. You are forgiven. And then God says you are free. You don't have to be a slave to the bad identity in your head. And you don't have to be chained to your family's history. You don't have to be chained to your successes or your failures. You are free. Now, everybody... Raise your heads and, and just look at those words on the screen and listen to me. That, like, that is absolutely who you are. That is who you are. So that is who you are when you're single and lonely and you're eating dinner by yourself again. And that is who you are when you're, you're married with kids and you feel claustrophobic. You haven't had a minute to yourself in weeks. That is who you are when you get the promotion that's who you are when you get laid off. That is who you are when you're addicted and afflicted and ashamed. And that is who you are when you're ignored or abused and refused. Like that just is who you are. No ifs, ands, or buts. End of story. It's finished. Whenever we feel stuck in these bad identities that we're living with, God doesn't call you names. You're doing that to yourself. He doesn't call you names. He calls you by name. When we're feeling defeated, completely defeated, God doesn't put a finger in your chest. He doesn't say, figure it out and buck up and pull yourself up by your bootstraps. He doesn't put a finger under your chest. He puts a finger under your chin. And he lifts your head back, back to confidence, back to true identity. And it's God who says, I will be your confidence and I will be your strength and I will be your victory and only I get to tell you who you are. And God says that you are mine and you are my masterpiece and you were lovingly knit together by me and you are my son and you are my daughter and no one takes you from me. God says, don't ever forget who I am. And don't ever forget who I say that you are. God is your creator. He reserves the sole right to tell you who you are. And who he says you are is freedom. So chins up, head high, shoulders back, eyes on him. Let's pray. God, first of all... Um, 30 years is a long time. I, we're thankful for what you're doing here. Um, I think sometimes we think that you're like infinite. And so 30 years is like, you know, just a blink of your eye. But no, you're personal. You're relational. You live with us. That's 30 years of you weeping when we have wept. That's 30 years of you celebrating when we celebrate. That's 30 years of you walking closely with us when we're in the valley and celebrating us when we're on top of the mountain. God, we thank you for that. God, we boldly ask for 30 more. God, I, I thank you for 
this truth that we found today. God, you are our creator. God, you made every, you're so beautiful. You made all this stuff that's like, it, it feels like whimsical almost, like stuff that doesn't even really serve a purpose, but it just brings us joy or it brings the world beauty. And God, you also created us and your works are wonderful. We know that full well. God, help us to actually maybe think that just about ourselves maybe once every now and then. God, help us to remember that we were lovingly knit together in our mother's womb. We are not forgotten. We are not abandoned. We are not anonymous. We are called by name, and we are yours. God, let that truth sink down into our hearts in a way that only you can do. No pastor, no sermon, no song can do it, but just you. Let that truth sink down into our hearts. God, we praise you for it. God, I love you for this community. I love you for this moment, and I pray this in your son's name. Amen.